All right. Hello, everybody. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, as you already know, my name is Matthew Wiro Finney. It's right there on the screen. Uh, you may know me from uh, my Zen Framework days. Uh, I was involved with the project from uh, 2005 when I started at Zen onwards and took over as project lead in 2009 and helped transfer it over to the Linux Foundation as the Laminus project uh, about a year and a half ago is when we finally uh, made that switch over. Uh, in the meantime, uh, Zend has been acquired twice, um, most recently by Perforce, and I am now actually uh, no longer in the engineering tree. I'm actually in the product management tree and am the uh, Zend product manager at Perforce. And that's a, a recent role change in the, in the past year. I'm still retained my uh, role as project lead for the Laminus project, uh, but that's a completely volunteer role at this point. We have a steering committee, uh, so uh, we have not, not just one person or one company making decisions, but a whole slew of people, which is fantastic. Today, I'm going to cover uh, what's new in PHP 8, and in particular, I'm covering syntax features, some new functions. Uh, some engine features and changes you really need to be aware of, and then uh, some of my final very opinionated thoughts on the new release. Uh, questions can happen anytime during this, as I mentioned before, so just go ahead and feel free to interrupt. I also have the chat on, uh, so I might actually see it in there. Uh, we'll see. Uh, that screen is what is in front of me versus what's in front of you, so I should be able to see it as we go forward. So first off, I'm going to cover syntax features. Uh, each major new release introduces uh, some changes. Uh, quite often, even in the minor releases, we add some syntax features as well. But I, the major releases are when the bulk of the really interesting ones happen. And the first of those is, of course, union types. And uh, that's the OR operator there. So it's used to indicate that a value may be one or two of two or more specified types. And so I have some examples here. Uh, for instance, if I'm accepting a number at, from a function, I might do int or float. Uh, to string could return a string or stringable uh, because of course a stringable is also, uh, that's a new interface. I forgot to bring this uh, interface out in this uh, talk because there's so much to talk about, but stringable defines underscore underscore to string. Uh, so you can always cast it into a string and be, use it in place of a string anywhere. I also have here, for instance, add filter as filter interface or callable. Uh, so these are things that you can do uh, in order to allow more than one type as an argument or to uh, say that you're going to return one or more types uh, as a return value. Uh, it's useful uh, where, uh, as I said, things like numbers, strings, uh, anything where it might be a callback or where the signature might uh, allow callbacks, that sort of thing. Another one of the new types that came out is mixed. What is mixed? It's basically anything. Uh, so unlike uh, some of the other intersection types, it's basically is an intersection type. It's a null, bool, int, float, string, array, callable, or object. Unlike that particular uh, example of a, an intersection type, this also accepts resources, which is not a real type in PHP. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about resources later because that's another engine change. Uh, but resources uh, cannot normally be type ended. So Mixed allows you to say, yeah, I'll accept anything, including the resource. It's mainly here for completeness. Uh, people want to be able to specify specific types. If you don't specify a type, a mixed is what is assumed, but you can make it more explicit by adding this, which is a, a nice piece. Uh, functionality for the language itself. Next up, class constructor property promotion. One of the bigger mouthfuls of names that we have here for features. What does it mean? It means that I can now declare my properties within my constructors. Okay, what do I mean by that? It means that, let's see if I can get the highlight here. Okay, there we are. Before we would have to choose, uh, you know, declare a property. And then what we would do is accept a value to our constructor, and then we would assign it in the constructor. So basically we have three lines. Now what we can do is define it in one place within our constructor itself, that's it. So if you add a visibility modifier 
to the value, uh, the, the argument, it will now be captured as a property as well. So I can define it there. Not only that, it's captured as property, but it's also implicitly defined. So you don't have to define it in your um, in the body of the constructor. I found this is really nice because it eliminates a ton of boilerplate that I normally have. Uh, so I can do, you know, if I especially have like a value object or an entity where I'm just accepting a whole bunch of typed instances, I can go and declare them in a constructor. And now those are now also properties and I'm done. Uh, so that makes it really, really simple for you to do this sort of operation. Moving on, part of this is that you can also interact with regular standard properties in there. So as an example, I have this uh, int UID and I can still declare this as a UID, but because it's an int, I need to cast that to a string somehow. So I will do that within my constructor. What's cool about the way these things work is that in the constructor, anything that you've declared by a property promotion in the signature itself has already been defined. So I can even interact with those values within my constructor if I want to do other calculations or anything in the initializations that I might have in there. So it's a really useful piece of functionality as well. One thing that's a gotcha that you need to remember is that callable types still need to be assigned manually. Uh, there's something weird about how PHP has handled callables from the very first time that they added closures back in 5.3. Um, because of the callables, uh, you can't call them as a normal function. Uh, you have to enclose them in parentheses. It's the same thing for some reason. You can't declare callable property uh, via constructor property promotion. I don't know the exact reasons for it. Clearly, it must have been difficult. Otherwise, they would have done it. Uh, so just be aware that that's the one thing you cannot do, and you'll get an engine error when you try. The next syntax change. How many of you here have used the colon colon class as a way to refer to a particular class? And I'm hoping a lot of people, uh, if you've been using uh, Zen Framework 2 or 3 or Laminus, uh, we use this quite often within when we're declaring our uh, service manager configuration. Uh, so for instance, that when you're assigning a factory to a class, your configuration will quite often use the class name as the key. And in that case, you can use colon colon class in order to basically ensure that it's going to be expanded correctly, but also it, that will be expanded based on the import statements. It helps reduce problems and typos essentially is what it comes down to. Now, before you could only do this based on the class name itself. Now you can actually do it based on an instance as well. And you can see this in this last line here. This was not possible before PHP 8, and now it is. I find this is really nice because, for instance, if I'm grabbing something from a plugin uh, manager of some sort, uh, I had it injected somewhere, and I want to know the exact type it is because perhaps I typed into it on an interface. I can now just say hydrator colon colon class, and I get back the name of the actual hydrator. And so it will be resolved based on the actual instance, which is useful. Named arguments. Oh my God, I've been wanting this feature forever. I actually came to PHP over 20 years ago from Perl and named arguments were just something that happened in the, the language. It was always there. It was great when you had long argument lists because you could go in and pass in specific arguments that you want to use. So with PHP, that's never been possible. People would often uh, accept an array. And so you'd have an associative array, and then you would pass it to a bunch of setters, or you pull things out of there in uh, order to assign them, that sort of thing. But the problem with that, of course, is then you have to do validations on, on all of those. You often have to have setters. Uh, there's all sorts of things that have to happen. And with typed arguments, increasingly, that sort of operation is just not viable. I want to be able to ensure that they're of a certain type. I don't want to have to do all that checking manually. So I want to be able to define my signatures with strong types. But I also want them all to be default values. And I want to be able to pass in just what I need. So named arguments allows you to do that in PHP 8. So uh, here's a great example is a defined cookie method. Uh, if you've ever used set cookie in PHP, this is a similar um, uh, signature here, but I'm using fully typed signature. So I have string name, a string value with a default value of an empty string, 
integer expires set to zero, path set to uh, an empty string, domain set to an empty, empty string, secure to uh, as a Boolean false, and HTTP only as a Boolean false. If I wanted to create a secure version cookie with a value of PHP 8, using named arguments, I can use the new syntax. And the syntax is what I am highlighting below here. It looks a lot like JSON or your JavaScript. Uh, and so it's a really nice uh, piece of functionality in that it looks familiar if you are familiar with using JSON on JavaScript. Now, Mark has jumped ahead and he obviously is reading my notes because I was going to point this out next. He points out that for library authors, this is a huge problem <laughs> because named arguments mean that it's now a BC break to change the name of an argument, whereas it wasn't before. Um, so it becomes a part of the public API. So that's the other drawback to this. Every time you have a new feature, there's all sorts of great things that happen, but occasionally there are drawbacks and that's one of them here. Uh, if you are a consumer, it's great. As a library author, you now have to worry about the BC implications of changing a name. I'm sure there's going to be a number of uh, uh, PHP CS rules around this. Uh, hopefully, uh, we'll see. <laughs> they have to look at diffs in order to know what's happening. So that's going to be problematic as well. Uh, one cool part about the named argument functionality that I didn't point out is it actually supports the spread operator as well. And this is where I come back to that whole idea of having a class or a function that accepts an array of configuration. Well, now what I can do is define that as an associative array. So here, so that I might be grabbing this from configuration, for instance, and I can pass that directly to that function call I had before, define cookie, through the spread operator. And because it's named arguments, it will know exactly how to handle this. So this is a really cool item that you can have as well. Now, this next one is something, again, people have been wanting for a really long time. You may have seen it as annotations. If you've used the Doctrine Annotations Library, you'll be familiar with the concept. Uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of frameworks have functionality around this. Symfony, uh, very notably so. Uh, for, for instance, the ability to say that something is a constructor, not a constructor, a uh, controller, or that it matches a particular route, or that it requires certain validations. Those are things that you were often able to define in annotations within uh, uh, Symfony and other frameworks do this as well. That now has a language level support via what are called attributes. Uh, and I believe they got the name attributes because other languages were using similar functionality. Your attributes start with the hashtag and square brackets. And uh, so you put those within your and uh, you put those before the, any piece of functionality that supports attributes. So that might be a method or a function or a property or a class. Um, I think, const I'm not sure about constants. Uh, there's a variety of things that can support attributes. What they allow you to do is create what's called an attribute processor. And so you run the code through the attribute processor and it alters how various PHP functionality is processed based on the attributes they define. So uh, let's take a look at this. What are things we can do with it? Why would I want to do this? I could annotate a class defining a request handler to indicate which route would cause it to be selected. So I'm, this is uh, something straight from Symfony, for instance, where I can say, hey, this particular handler responds to the root foobar. And so you'll see what looks like a class name and then a value behind it. And typically what will happen as you do an attribute is your attribute processor will get that. It will instantiate that thing that might be root with the arguments that you provide to it. So the argument order generally does matter in this case. Another example is I might annotate a function parameter to detail validations to run on the value. So for instance, I might say that uh, a validator of an int and not empty. So it needs to pass both of those particular criteria in order to be valid. I can map a class property to a SQL column. So this is going back to doctrine annotations. So column, username. Uh, these all got split onto the next line, so I apologize for that. Uh, so I'll keep going from there. 
And uh, one of the big ones that was brought out was deprecated. So you could run this over your code and a uh, processor would say, hey, this is deprecated and maybe raise a warning or send a log message or whatever the case may be. So attributes are really interesting. I think uh, you know we've had support for this in userland for quite a long time. Now it's available through the reflection API. You can run this over your code. Uh, I see foresee a lot of preprocessors using this in order to create uh, you know, rules for your application, uh, whether that's uh, routing, whether it's validations, et cetera, things that will go and do this stuff for you. So you're going to see a lot of the stuff it's already existed in userland now it's going to be switching over to attributes from the uh, userland annotations that happened before uh, and there's going to be a definite this is how things are done because this is what the language supports and i think that's always a good thing uh, instead of having three or four different competing annotations libraries doing things differently every time having just uh, one language level feature is going to be really useful another syntax feature match expressions Okay, so what's wrong with switching case? Well, first off, it's loose matching by default. If you want strict matching, you actually have to have an explicit case statement with an expression. So case method equals post. I hate having to do more work to do the thing that is a best practice. Uh, if I had, I'd rather have the best practice be the default case. If you want to exit the structure, you have to do an explicit break or return statement. Uh, and in fact, this is such a problem that most coding standards have some sort of rule to check to see if you haven't done something like a comment that says fall through at the end of a case statement. Uh, because if you haven't, then it's going to say, well, you probably have an error here. Again, it should be easy to do the default uh, best practice here. the potential for uninitialized values if you are assigning a value within a case statement and then you need to refer to it later if you didn't assign it before the switch you have the possibility for it not to be initialized and that's a problem so what does a match expression look like a match expression returns the value of an expression that matches exactly without proportion so on this side here i've got player is two and then i've got a name is the result of matching player against this set. And so on the left hand side, I've got integers and on the right hand side, I've got strings. So in this case, because player is two, it will return green elf. If player were a string two, it would not match. And in fact, it would raise an on match an unhandled match error. Uh, so if it doesn't match, we're dead. There's a way around that and I'll show you that in a few minutes. But the idea here is that it does the right thing by default. And that's the important part. So some more examples here. The right side can be a constant, uh, such as I had in the previous one. Uh, so I had constant strings there, like red bar, green elf. Or it can be a single line expression. So I can do something like straight or lower. Or I could do a short, uh, uh, short function, for instance, uh, if you remember these from 7.4, where I do fn and the argument, and then I just have an expression on the other side of the arrow. That's the other possibility you can do there. But it has to be a single line expression, no multi line expressions. You can't have a callback in there, uh, you know, a closure that goes over multiple lines. That does not work. That is, in fact, an error. You can also match multiple conditions. So that was one of the things that uh, switch statements allowed you to do is you could say, hey, I've got these multiple conditions that all need to be handled the same way. And you can do that as well with match. And the way it's done is by using a comma separating the different values that you have for your conditions on the left hand side. So in this case, uh, lower and lowercase both give us a string to lower of the value, whereas upper and uppercase give a stir to upper of the value. Now, I mentioned before that if I didn't match exactly, so if I had a string two here, it would raise an unhandled match error. You can actually have a default match. So I can, at this point, put in default, and that's a string default is uh, the way it works. And if that's there, Whatever is on the right hand side of that is going to be what is returned. So if I have that string two, 
in that previous one, if I had added a default, then it would do this default thing and return that value from the match. The other thing that you can do here, and again, this is something that you could do in your switch statements and your case statements before, is you could have an expression on the left-hand side. You can also have expressions on the left-hand side with match expressions. So I can say request get, get method. So that's a, a very useful, uh, that should be handle matching methods. I hate it when I see typos after I've edited the slides three or four times. <laughs> Goes to show that you should always have another pair of eyes probably looking over these. This is another pair of eyes, it's a pair of eyes two days later. Uh, anyway, there's a lot of things that you can do here. So this is a really handy uh, functionality. It's stuff people have been asking for for years because of all the problems with switching case. So I'm excited about match expressions. I'm not so excited about the fact that I can't do multi-line expressions, but you know, there are ways around that. So it's not a big deal. Let's go here. Our next syntax change, the null safe operator. So we've actually had, I mentioned earlier, the one of the syntax changes was uh, the idea of intersections. Uh, so the intersection operator, so that you could do parameter intersections and return value intersections. We've actually had one since uh, 7.2, and that's the when we declared the ability to do nullable types. So if you put a question mark in front of a type, you have uh, the ability to return that type or a null. The problem with that is if you're returning, for instance, in this case, class type or a nullable class type, whatever is calling on that now has to check to see if it got a null value before it tries to call a method on it. And so people quickly discovered this uh, starting with 7.2, like, oh, this is great. Oh, except for I still have to do that checking. I didn't like doing that checking. I, and before I would check to see if I got didn't have that class type. Uh, now I have to check to see if I have null. Well, here's the fun part is the null safe operator. When that is placed there, so if I, called process on some instance. And I know I'm going to get back a class type or a null value. If I use the null safe operator, what will happen is it will, if the return value was actually that class, it's going to call some method. But if I got a null back, it will return null. And so in this case, if process returned null, var export here is going to return null as well. So that makes it a lot easier to consume these nullable types, which is, again, something that makes it easier to write your code successfully the first time. Next syntax change, catch by type only. How many times have you gone and done a catch statement and then just not even used the exception or the error that was returned? I know I've done it a ton, particularly when I'm logging something and it's not really important what the exception is, just that it happened. So in this case, I might know that no config service was found in the container because it was a service not found exception. I don't need to inspect the exception in this particular case. So note that in this particular instance, I am just catching a service not found exception. There is no $E. This is something you can now do in PHP 8. And that is really nice, particularly if you're using static analysis tools, which are going to say, hey, you've declared $E, but you've not actually used it. And, and what you find yourself doing is adding exceptions for that or putting in ignore rules for that. And that's never good. I don't want to be cluttering my code with rules for my uh, static analysis detectors, my coding standards detectors, that sort of thing. Now I can just ignore it safely and not have to worry. Speaking of exceptions, if you remember, as we're talking about match expressions, you can do a single line expression on the right. What if you want to throw an exception there? Well, the fun part is you can now throw exceptions from expressions. And uh, I'm throwing, showing you a few different examples here. But say, for instance, you're defining a short function where basically it's a callback. And if you get into that callback, you want to raise an exception that should not have gotten here. Or if you are doing a ternary where if it doesn't match, you should not have gotten here. Or if you are doing a ternary, a, a null coalesce statement where if the value is not defined, you should not have gotten here. 
These are all examples of, of how that will work. So you can now throw an express uh, throw an exception as a short function uh, expression. I can also do it within my ternary. So I have done it here. I can do it in either section of the ternary. So if it were an instance of filter and I don't want it to be a filter, I could throw the runtime exception, otherwise assign the value back and forth, however I want to do that. And then with no col null coalesce, if the value is not assigned, I'm going to raise an exception. So that wraps up my syntax changes. There's actually more. Uh, as I mentioned, there's a number of new interfaces. Uh, there's a number of uh, other minor changes at this point. But I think these are the more interesting ones, the ones that are going to affect your coding most often. So at this point, we're going to run into the new functions. We get new functions again every major release and every minor release. Uh, they are rarer and rarer as time goes on. I actually don't see a ton of them being added except via uh, extensions uh, anymore. It's fairly rare to get new ones into the core. But we got a few new ones this time, one of which is stir contains. I don't know about you, but I have been writing stir pause haystack needle not equals false forever, and I hate it. Uh, so it's really on intuitive. Uh, if you don't know, if you are not terribly familiar with PHP, you're coming into it uh, as a, a new practitioner here. This is really on intuitive. What does this actually mean? Well, it means that I didn't find foo within foobar baz anywhere in there. The reason why I have to do a strict equality against false is because if I found it at the zero location, the, uh, the first character in there, it returns a zero, which would evaluate to false. So I have to be strict about my comparison to false. Now I can just say start contains. And this is a Boolean that accepts a string haystack, a string needle, and it returns a Boolean. This is far more intuitive. Honestly, I have no idea why this was never proposed before. I'd love it and I'll be using it all the time. Here's another one. I'm not, I didn't even give examples of how to do this uh, before because they're so convoluted. You had to use things like stir pause, uh, stir r pause, and substring, uh, and various combinations thereof sometimes to find if a string starts or ends with another string. Now we have stir starts with and stir ends with. And again, it's a, a haystack and a needle uh, returning a Boolean. This is so much easier. Uh, unfortunately, we also see our problem. Uh, we actually, it's exacerbated in this one. There are a number of string operators, uh, string functions that begin with string and others that begin with str. And now we have uh, several that start with str underscore. And so it's just getting more convoluted. I wish there were some sort of uh, naming strategy that they could just stick with in core, but uh, so it goes. Next one that I find interesting is preg last error message. Uh, Interestingly enough, a lot of people aren't aware that uh, pReg match and pReg replace will return errors. And the way you do this is uh, you check to see if pReg last error is equal to uh, pReg no error. If not, then you had an error. So this, this string right here, this sequence there. What you had to do before is similar to what we had to do with JSON before we had JSON last error message. What we had to do before was go and map the constants to the string a message that we wanted to use in order to report, uh, report that error. And the problem that happened was that uh, some libraries would do it differently than others. So there was no easy way to go and standardize around it. Now there is. And so uh, just like JSON last error message gave us that ability to report our JSON errors a little bit better, pReg last error message does as well. And all you have to do then is if you've detected an error is you echo your pReg last error message. I'm really hoping that this is going to allow us to now raise exceptions against this in a future version, just like we did with uh, JSON. But even just having this is going to be far easier. <clears throat> 
Uh, just a point, uh, going back to this previous one, I, I do actually check and see how things are going in the chat every now and then. Uh, Mark Baker noted that the uh, new STIR functions are all case sensitive, uh, and there are no equivalent case insensitive versions. Uh, so that's something to be aware of with these uh, STIR starts with, STIR ends with, and STIR contains, is that they are case sensitive, so you'll have to be very careful about that. If you want insensitive ones, uh, what you should do is cast your uh, haystack to uh, lower or uppercase and then use the, that particular variant for the needle. Our next new function, get debug type. This is a common, I, what I have here as an example is something that's really common throughout the Laminus and Metzio code bases. We will often use sprintf uh, in order to format a message and expand values. One of those that we often are trying to expand is, you know, if a value has come in and it could be a mixed types, we'll say is object value, then get class value, otherwise get type value. So we have this ternary expression here. What get debug type does is allow us to just call get debug type. And I found another typo that semicolon is not supposed to be there. So what we do is we do the class name, it will return the class name for objects uh, and the type for scalars and arrays. So uh, null, string, int, float, uh, array, um, bool, and those. For closures, it will return closure, uh, that class name. For anonymous classes, it will be class at anonymous. And for those that are subclasses, it will be the uh, the uh, parent class at anonymous in this case. Uh, so it will report those for you. I, I've been actually using this for some time. Symphony has had a polyfill for it for over a year now because uh, they anticipated this going in. Uh, and it's a it's just really nice not to have to go and remember all this. I can just pay, say get debug type and then know it's going to be correct every single time. So those are the, we've gone through our syntax changes. These are our new functions. Now let's go into the new engine features. And when I talk about engine features, these are like fundamental changes to how things work under the hood in PHP. And some of these sometimes affect us as developers. The one that everybody has been talking about forever, uh, it's since even before PHP 7, because it was originally slated for PHP 7, and that's the just-in-time or JIT compilation. Now, where, what does this even mean? Let's take a look at it. PHP is what's called an interpreted language. And what happens with PHP is the engine goes and locates a source code that's necessary. Uh, so that might be looking up a class file, if, uh, it might be looking up um, a file that has functions, whatever the case. It locates the source code. And then it lexes and tokenizes that code. And basically it's breaking it up into different tokens that it can recognize. So, oh, this is a class definition. This is the name of the class. Uh, here is the constructor. Uh, and it breaks it up into all these tokens. And from there, it parses those tokens into what's called an abstract syntax tree. Uh, this is only true starting with seven uh, forward. Uh, before that, it, they didn't do the abstract syntax tree. But this gives us a whole flow of this particular set of code, how it works. At that point, the abstract syntax tree is passed to the VM, uh, the, the Zend engine, which then compiles that into opcodes, which are VM instructions. And it interprets those opcodes, which compiles them to machine code. So we have compiled, we've parsed and tokenized, we've compiled into an AST, and then we've compiled into opcodes, which we then compiled into machine code, which we can now execute. So there's a lot of steps to this. PHP is blazingly fast at this. Uh, it's incredibly fast. And if you look at other interpreted languages, PHP typically outshines them by um, orders of magnitude at how good it is. Now in PHP 5.6, we add in an op cache. And what this does is we go from locate the source code and then we check to see if it's in the cache. If it's not in the cache, we go and do the lexing and parsing and compiling into op codes. But then if it is in the cache, we just go and directly to passing those on to 
the uh, VM, which is going to compile those into machine code, and then we execute machine code. So we're able to get rid of some steps, the lexicon tokenization, the parsing, and then the creation of the opcodes. That can go away. Uh, so this will only happen as it goes over code over and over again. So you have to have a long running process. So that might be an Apache with mod PHP. It might be your PHP FPM pool. It will manage the opcache for you and then it takes care of this fairly efficiently. It does have limits. You, you know, once it gets full, it's gonna drop off stuff that it hasn't seen before or that it hasn't been seen very often. And it tries to be pretty optimistic about this. If I'm seeing something repeatedly, I'll keep that in the cache. Now, starting with 7.4, we finally got even more features on top of that. And that was the opcache preloading feature. What this does is it creates a file, you, you as a user, as a developer, create a file with a list of code that it's gonna pre-compile pre into the opcodes. And what happens then is on startup, the PHP engine then compiles that code into opcodes so that when it sees references to those, it can just immediately go and say, hey, that's a cache hit. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm going to compile those to byte codes and then uh, to machine codes and we'll go from there. There's some limitations to this. If you're running more than one application on the server, you have to be really careful with the opcache preloading because you might have things that are in different versions. You might have naming conflicts. You have to be careful with it. It can give you a boost. Uh, the best boost that you'll generally get is going to be if you put stuff in there that is going to be bootstrapped every time anyway. So a number of frameworks have some functionality about seeding in the stuff that's going to be always loaded so that that can be part of your opcache preloading. And it's great. And this was actually a preview of what was going to happen with JIT. So the fact of the matter is compiling those opcodes into machine code is still expensive. That's more expensive and in some cases than some of the other operations that happen. So what the JIT in PHP 8 does is it identifies hotspots in the code for you. What are the things that are CPU intensive or that you're doing over and over again? And it will then compile that code to machine code. And what then happens is the execution for those code paths becomes locate the source code. Oh, I've seen that, execute the machine code, I'm done. So that's great. We've just skipped like six steps. I love that. Okay, here is the true talk. The JIT only helps with CPU intensive workloads. And the fact of the matter is most of our PHP applications are IO limited. So it's database queries, HTTP requests, cache lookups, file system access. Some real-time benchmarks show that a standard WordPress instance is only getting about a 3% gain from this. So the thing is, is we have to identify what the JIT is really going to help with. And when you see this, a lot of people are going to say, why are we doing this at all? So Nikita Popov, uh, if you follow PHP development at all, uh, he's been on the PHP core team for, I think, going on about a decade now. Uh, he made three really interesting comments about the JIT and why it's important. The first is that we get significantly better performance for numerical calculations. So, you know, of course, if you've seen any other demonstrations about the JIT, you'll see things like the Mandelbrot set or fractals and stuff like that. Those are really cool to see because you can see just how fast PHP becomes with the JIT. Um, most of us don't do those, that we really don't, but it gives us the possibility to do that, which is great. Now, the next part is that we get slightly better performance for your typical PHP application. 3% is not nothing. 3% on a, something that's getting hundreds of thousands of hits a day, that's going to save you some uh, uh, quite a bit of energy. It's going to save you uh, bandwidth. It's going to save you a bunch of things. It's just not that 10 to 20% or that two times faster that we got in PHP 7, right? And that's, uh, you know, it's it kind of sucks, but on the flip side, we do get better before performance and we can't you know, just sniff our noses at that. It's a good thing. But I think the more interesting thing he pointed out was that we get the potential to move code from C to PHP because PHP is now sufficiently fast. What does this mean? My takeaway on this is that it means that there's a potential that we might be able to define new PHP language features, such as those new functions and aliases within PHP itself, 
instead of having to do it in C. And that's going to open the door to more contributors. This hasn't been done yet, but the idea is there. And what it would mean is that when we compile PHP, when we build the distributions, part of that step will be going through a list of PHP files and compiling those using legit to machine code. And that's gonna be really cool. But the other bit is that we get the potential for new things. So remember this last one I said, we get significantly better performance for numerical calculations. Well, those are the sorts of things that you need for things like machine learning and AI, which means PHP now becomes a viable option for that. And in particular, because long running daemons are going to get more efficient over time because again, the JIT compiler is looking for those hotspots for those things that it's done over and over again. And this is actually pretty big because right now the big player out there for machine learning is Python. If we can be faster than Python and have good libraries for machine learning, people are gonna to wanna to do things in PHP, which means that we retain some of our dominance on the web in part because we can also do the machine learning things. Imagine an API endpoint where people are feeding in data and it's going and calculating, doing number crunching and whatever it needs to do in order to create algorithms for your own application. So that's gonna be really cool. So that's the big, big language feature for PHP 8, but there's a few others. One of them is that it now has fatal errors on incompatible signatures. So in the past, if I had defined this interface with a public function of process that accepted an object item and returned an array, and then I declared this child class that implemented that but changed the argument from an object to an array, I would just get a warning, just a warning. And it would go all along barely doing its thing. Now you will get a fatal error. So if you relied on this fact, you now need to think about how you're gonna do your upgrade to PHP 8. Uh, so somebody was talking about this, well, it's always backwards compatible. Well, here's something that's not. Uh, so again, this is the right behavior. It really absolutely should do this, uh, but it didn't do it before. And so that's something to be uh, to consider. Keep going to the wrong screen here. The next thing at the engine level, LSP enforcement. LSP stands for the Liskov Substitution Principle. And it details conditions whereby a class may substitute for an interface or parent class. And the Rules around this are it must accept the same number and types of parameters, and it must return something of the same type. Now, what does it mean by same type? Let's take a look at an example. So here I have an interface processor and then a class reflection processor with a reflection processor that's implementing it. And next I'm gonna define a class consumer. And in this, I'm going to have a method called consume processor that is accepting a reflection processor and just returning a processor. So our interface. And so any instance of it, it might be the same reflection processor, it might be a different one. And now I'm gonna do a child consumer extending consumer where I change the signature. Now before this didn't work and it does now. Now, why does this work? Well, let's say I'm using child consumer in place of a consumer. If I pass a reflection processor, uh, somebody speaking. <laughs> if I pass a reflection processor to the child consumer, it can still accept that. So that totally fits in with the LSP. Additionally, I'm going to return a reflection processor from my child consumer. That's still a processor. So again, it works. So we have good enforcement of this uh, now within PHP 8, and it works in both directions. If I do it incorrectly, so for instance, if uh, my consumer were to uh, consume a different type of processor, not a reflection processor, or if I were to return a, uh, more specific, a, um, an object instead of a processor uh, from the child consumer, those things will break uh, the LSP. So PHP 8 is now doing all this correctly and it enforces it everywhere. 
Uh, I find this thing to be really useful because I hate it when I go to use a class and I can't actually use it because it doesn't follow the same contract. So if I'm using interfaces uh, and I'm doing strong types between everything, I will get errors early if I discover that, particularly in third party code. Now it's the next feature I alluded to before, and I alluded to it when we talked about the mixed type. And I said that mixed is the only type that also accepts resources. Well, <laughs> we have something new for you in PHP 8, and that is the resource class. I mentioned before, PHP actually has no specific resource type. I can't type hint against it. Uh, I can't reuse a type hint to return it, which means that I have to leave a mixed type hint or just no type hint for it and check to see, you know, is it a resource? And if I want to be even more specific, like for instance, I want a GD resource, I have to check to see, is it a resource? And is it a resource of the correct type? So I'd say get resource type something uh, not equal to a specific thing. And I would throw an error in this particular case. Uh, this is problematic. And for a lot of us doing object-oriented code all the time, we're loving all the type hints. Uh, it makes our code um, more with the type safety, it makes it easier for us to write maintainable code, easier for us to write correct code. So what PHP did is it started introducing resource classes. These are non-instantiable resource types that are returned from specific methods. So in uh, the curl extension, if you call curl in it, starting in PHP 8, you'll get a curl handle. Uh, the various image create from methods from the GD extension return a GD image. Uh, the socket uh, functions that return uh, socket resources before now return a socket class and the socket address info lit up uh, function call uh, returns an address info class. What's great is I now can type in on these specific things and I can return those specific things, which is amazing. I love this. Uh, I can declare my properties to be a curl handle or a GD image or a socket. Uh, there's going to be more of these coming in 8.1. The plan is for every resource type to have a resource class associated with it. And there's a possibility because these are becoming classes that they might start adding functions to them later. Right now, they just are a placeholder for the resource itself. Now, the gotcha, whereas before we could do things like curl close or socket close, those no longer destroy the resource. You can call that all you want, but it actually doesn't destroy the resource. So in those cases, you now have to call onset. Uh, so I'm highlighting it down here. You actually have to onset it to destroy the resource. That's a big gotcha because if you were plan, you know, expecting this to go away uh, when you called close on it before, it will not. Uh, so again, this is another uh, BC break in the language for really, really good reason, uh, but it is a BC break. I wish they'd been able to handle uh, <laughs> excuse the pun, uh, but when I say things like curl close handle with that resource type, it would have been nice if it would destroy it, uh, but uh, for a variety of reasons, that was not the way uh, they chose to do it. So you now have to call onset. And yes, as Mark uh, notes, uh, static analysis tools and uh, coding standards tools will start to flag these fairly soon uh, if they haven't already. Uh, so you'll be able to make sure that your code is doing things correctly for PHP 8. If you are writing code that needs to support both seven and eight, uh, such as library authors like myself, uh, you now have to worry about both of these things. So fun times. The next change at the engine level, uh, assertion behavior. So assertions were uh, originally introduced in PHP 4 and by default all this time, all they've done is raise a warning unless you set the assertion.exception ini value to enabled. What PHP 8 does at this point is it enables that flag by default. Again, a subtle BC break, uh, but if you were expecting it to only raise a warning before in production and you haven't changed your PHP INIs, uh, it will now actually raise an exception. So again, be aware of that behavior. The XML RPC extension has been moved out of core. This has been in core since I, whenever it was introduced, I can't remember if it was PHP 4 or PHP 3. 
Uh, so instead of being a built-in module, it is now moved to Peckle. So if you were using this extension in PHP uh, 7 before, you will now have to install it separately in PHP 8. If you're using system packages uh, or even things like the Remy or Andre repositories or Zen PHP, uh, in all of those cases, there's an, ex uh, an extension package for it anyway, so it won't affect a lot of people. But if you are compiling it yourself, you'll have to grab that from Peckle. Uh, Zoli asked, uh, going back to this here, uh, Zoli asked if curl close is a no op now, essentially. Yes. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure if it does anything at this point. Um, uh, all I do know is that the handle is still, uh, the resource still exists at that point, uh, which means that if you try and open it again, it could potentially cause issues. Uh, so it's best just to say on set at this point, just to ensure that uh, you don't have to worry about that. Next thing, uh, reflection changes. Uh, one of the big things, of course, is that we now have a get attributes uh, method on all types capable of attributes. Uh, so that's going to be, you know, that's going to be how you go and consume those attributes for the most part. Uh, so I covered attributes in the syntax level portion. Here is the engine level portion of it that facilitates it is that we have these methods available in reflection. Now, due to the addition of union and mixed types, uh, each of the following are deprecated, and that's the reflection parameter as a get class, uh, is array, and is callable methods. Uh, those go away. And if you're going, okay, what happens if those are deprecated? There is a replacement, and that's get type. And that will return uh, whether it's a class, if it's an array, if it's a callable, that sort of thing. Uh, so it will return that for you. So you have to start moving to that. Uh, the nice part is it's a deprecation. Uh, so that means that you have all of the eight series in order to update your code. Um, and I know some things like uh, Laminous Code, we already have a version that's PHP 8 only. So it's doing this sort of thing for you. So uh, I've been long-winded here and going through a lot of things. There's actually a whole bunch of other deprecations I'm not even covering uh, simply because I, it takes a lot of time. And we, as we go through uh, uh, all the syntax changes and then of course the JIT, there's just really not much time for anything else. So I'm going to go through my highly opinionated summary. I think there's some great syntactical improvements to simplify, simplify common boilerplate. Uh, I absolutely love the constructor property promotion. I think the match operator is going to simplify my life greatly. I like the ability to uh, throw exceptions uh, as, uh, uh, as statements. Uh, that's something I've been wanting forever. I, again, I came from Perl, and so you could do things like uh, this or this, and the, the or side was usually raise an exception or an error of some sort. You now have that sort of simpler, simpler way of doing things. Uh, within PHP as well. I also really like the named arguments, uh, although as a library author, I'm really, really not happy about the uh, BC implications that I have there. The improved error and exception handling is great. Um, I, I mentioned the uh, ability to throw exceptions uh, from statements. Uh, I also really like the ability to not have to capture my exception or th uh, throwable value uh, in every single case. Uh, the expansions to the type systems are nice. I really, really like the idea of the resource classes, and I hope they expand on them greatly going forward. Uh, I think it's a nice first step. Uh, I think the attributes are going to lead to interesting rad tooling. I mean, we already have a lot of this stuff, uh, but being able to do it in a way that might be slightly faster, uh, and that is uh, a standard, this is how they work across every application, is going to be really nice. Uh, and finally, I think the JIT looks really, really interesting, but I think its impact is still to be determined. I know that there are core uh, members of the PHP development team who are really upset about it because it actually makes contribution to the engine far harder. Uh, and because you always have to now worry about what the input impact is gonna be on the JIT. And there's only a handful of people across the world who really know how just-in-time compilers really, really work at their core. Uh, so I'm curious to see how well it works um, and what it's going to uh, allow us to do in the language. I think machine learning is one of those places where I think we may see some leaps and bounds in the next year or two as people start adopting it. Uh, but again, it's still to be seen. I uh, thank you for listening to me babble today.
uh, if you want to communicate with me, I, I tweet at MWAP uh, infrequently. Uh, actually, most of it are reposts from Instagram, such as this picture here, uh, where I post as Fly Tangle. I also blog, again, infrequently at MWAP.net. Uh, but if you go to that landing page, it also shows you where I'm blogging elsewhere, particularly on the Zend blog, uh, where I, I typically have one or two uh, a month up on the Zend blog as well. Um, there's a question from Mark. Uh, do attributes currently require pre-processing? I uh, says that they require that. Uh, do I think that they'll be modified in future version to allow triggering of the attribute class at runtime without the need for pre-processing? Maybe. Uh, I mean, right now, it, essentially, when you do that pre-processing, you're going to create um, a decorator or a proxy classes uh, in these particular cases that will gate the stuff for you. So if I declare uh, an attribute on a parameter and it declares a uh, validation, that's what you're typically going to do. I would love it if we could have them at runtime. I also think that could be incredibly expensive. Uh, so having the ability to do pre-processing allows you to write more optimized code for these sorts of things. And so we'll see how things go. Um, I, I don't know, it'd be awesome, yeah. but it's also going to be slow, I think. To uh, out of school scope for this RFC, I think it said. Yeah, it was out of scope for the RFC. I think it's possible they might add it, but I, I think the um, performance implications are going to be something that make it difficult for it to ever really happen well, excuse me, uh, to happen well. Um, so we'll see. I'm going to close the slides uh, so that we can talk face to face if we want to. If I can find my cursor, there it is. There we go.